We want to the uh, today's uh, um, Kanban Zuna series co-hosted by the University of Waterloo and uh, the Phil's Institute. Before we begin, I'd like to ask all the participants please to uh, uh, mute yourself so that uh, we could avoid any uh, interference with the talk. Uh, so please do that as soon as possible. Uh, so uh, for today, we have uh, um, uh, a treat uh, because we're going to be uh, listening to both a theoretician and an experimentalist that talk that shows uh, what math biology is all about, uh, a real, a true collaboration between um, a mathematical work that could be combined with experimental work to explain a set of phenomena in biology, um, which is the work that will be presented by both uh, Dr. Sneed, James Sneed, and Dr. David Yu. So let me give you some background about uh, both of them. Um, James uh, did his first degree in uh, Dunedin, I think. How is it pronounced, uh, my, uh, James? Dunedin. Dunedin, okay. Dunedin, Dunedin in New Zealand, uh, where he was also born. And then uh, uh, he did his PhD at uh, New York, which was rather a change, one might say. <laughs> After a postdoc with uh, Jim Murray at Oxford, uh, he then worked at a number of places um, in, the, in the US, UCLA, University of Michigan, and New Zealand, before ending up at the University of Auckland in New Zealand, where he has been for about, uh, his claims, 300 years but um, um, he still looks young, so I don't think so. Um, he lives right now uh, beside a beach and he would probably rather be swimming than giving a talk. That's what he can <laughs> uh, As for David, uh, David Yule, he did his PhD in physiology from the University of Liverpool in 1990, a postdoc at the University of Michigan, where he had his uh, life-changing experience for meeting James, apparently. In 98, until present, he's been at the Department of Pharmacology and Physiology at the University of Rochester Medical School in New York. Um, he has interest in calcium signaling, control secretion, and uh, uh, in uh, exocrine glands, uh, so, such as the pancreas and uh, salivary glands. And uh, we look forward to hearing this, this talk. So the microphone is yours. Thank you very much, and I should first begin by saying hi to John Rinzel, who I see there. Hi, John. <laughs> okay, I shall just share my screen, bring up my PowerPoint. I hope you can all see my PowerPoint. Uh, David and I, and actually John Rugus, who has done a lot of the computations for the talk today, are all here, and mostly uh, David and I will be talking about our work, our joint work in uh, modeling the secretion of saliva, which sounds kind of non-glamorous and a little dull, but actually saliva is pretty cool when you learn more about it. I'm going to be just begin with some opening remarks, and this is because I was told there would be quite a few graduate students and postdocs here, and so I thought I'd take the opportunity to preach a little about how you do interdisciplinary work, though I see many of the names who are actually attending know more about interdisciplinary work than I do, which makes my remarks somewhat, somewhat out of date, I suppose. Anyway, David Yule and I, we've been working together for a long time. We uh, uh, first met each other when we both worked at the University of, Mich of Michigan. And the key to our collaboration has always been that, that we've learned to speak the language of the other person. So I've had to learn a lot about what calcium does, how cells, how cells work, that kind of thing. And David has had to learn actually a lot about modeling, although he probably claims he hasn't, but I assure you that he really has. We each have a different skill set and we find that we can solve problems much more effectively when we each use these sets of uh, different skills to approach the problem. I ne never ever do experiments, of course. David does all those for me. That's in fact his job. He thinks I do math for him, but in fact, that's not true. He does experiments for me. Don't believe anything else. Why do we do a model? Well, this is, this is kind of a question which you often get asked by groups of experimentalists. And I think the crowd here probably is uh, relatively well convinced that doing a model is a good thing. But experimentalists are often not, in fact, in my experience. And so you, you have to point out that what is the, the most important thing about modeling is you have to recognize what a model isn't. And what a model is not is simply just a reproduction of the data you see. Because if you simply reproduce data, then the experimentalists tend to say, well, I already knew that. So what additional 
uh, information has the mob given to me that I didn't know, uh, that I didn't know before. And therefore you have to really think what is the point of doing a model? And in my opinion, a model is really nothing but a tool for making predictions that you can go and test. You can reproduce all kinds of wonderful data and have your model do all the right things and blah, 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 blah. But if you don't use that model to make predictions, then I don't really think you're doing your job. So that's the whole focus of what we'll be talking about today. We don't have enough time to go into detail about how David and I have worked on generating predictions and testing predictions. But it is true that over the last 10 to 15 years or so, um, as David and I have talked on the phone a lot, uh, that we have, uh, we have come up with a string of one prediction after another. And some of them have been tested, some of them haven't, some of them have worked out, some of them haven't. But that has always been the focus of our joint work. Which means that if you get comments like, you know, your model doesn't contain this particular protein or your model doesn't do this particular twiddle in my graph and therefore your model is rubbish and you still get comments of exactly that kind. But that just means that those kinds of comments you can safely ignore because they come from someone who basically doesn't really understand what modeling is about. All right, now with any model, you have to start with the question and it's absolutely vital, you start with the data. So given that, I'm going to pass the talk over to David, who is going to be presenting quite a lot of the data that we've been working on together. So David, it's over to you. Yeah, you have to hit that big green button that says share. Yeah, I'm doing that. I'm doing that. <laughs> Can you see this now? Yes. Okay. So um, my lab has been for the last 30 years or so interested in calcium signaling. Now, um, you all are very familiar with the fact that calcium is important structurally in our bodies. It's, it's in our bones and teeth. We have about a, a 1.2 kilograms of calcium in our body and all but about 1% of that is in bones and teeth. And the 1% that's not in bones and teeth is the really exciting calcium. So free calcium um, rather than structural calcium in bones and teeth controls a multitude of function. It controls functions from the, um, uh, from the uh, onset of life at fertilization to cell death. It controls uh, processes such as excitosis and fluid secretion. These are things that I'm interested in. It also in, um, controls gene, gene transcription, muscle contraction, cell motility, ATP um, production. So my lab has been interested in calcium signaling. And as a model, uh, we have used um, the exocrine glands of the pancreas and salivary gland. And the reason we've, we do this is that just about anything that these glands do, which is um, relevant, functionally relevant, is controlled by calcium. So this is a, a low um, magnification micrograph of what these glands look like. Um, they essentially are two cell types. Uh, they, they're, they're made up of asinous cells, which are the secretory cells. Um, and the asinous cells secrete fluid and protein into a lumen which becomes a duct, and then the duct will empty out into a cavity. So for, for salivary glands, it's obviously the oral cavity, and for pancreas, it's the, um, the pancreatic juice and enzymes are emptied into the duodenum. So exocrine secretion is about secreting into a duct, endocrine secretion into the blood. So a more um, high resolution micrograph, here is, here is actually a a micrograph of the ducts. You can see the ducts as well as the asna cells here. And the green stain is actually a chloride channel. And this chloride channel is actually calcium sensitive. And this is fundamental to the process um, of fluid secretion from both pancreas uh, and salivary glands and, and indeed your lacrimal glands in your eye and uh, from mammary glands. So um, mechanistically to secrete fluid, uh, essentially, you have to move sodium and chloride from the blood base of a cell um, through an epithelia, 
into a lumen, into that lumen which is going to become the stalks or the duct. So the mechanism is, is pretty well defined and essentially it relies on the transepithelial movement of chloride. So chloride comes in on this transporter um, in combination with sodium and potassium which drag it into the cell and then leaves um, into the lumen uh, through a channel, which was that green channel I showed you on the micrograph, it's called TMEM16A. And chloride entering the lumen makes the, the lumen negative. Sodium follows paracellularly between the gaps in the cells and that gives you sodium and chloride. And water follows to balance the osmotic potential that the sodium and chloride in the lumen um, has, has, um, has established. So we've, 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 we've moved sodium and chloride in water, and that's essentially your saliva. How that's stimulated is, as, 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 you, as you know, that the um, smell, the taste, um, and the sight of food actually activates neural input to the gland, which um, releases acetylcholine, a neurotransmitter that binds to a receptor and will increase calcium within the cell. And that increase in calcium occurs, as we'll, as we'll show in a, a few minutes, on a second-to-second -second basis. It's very dynamic. And the calcium activates two effectors. It activates this chloride channel on the luminal membrane to actually open it and increase the flux of chloride. And it activates a potassium channel on the, um, thought of as being on the basolateral membrane, to keep the membrane polarized to favor chloride flux. Okay, so that's the basic mechanism and, and shows the importance of calcium. If we, if we look at uh, a picture of uh, isolated um, cells from these glands, you can see how beautifully polarized they are. So the red here is the sodium potassium ATPase, which is a protein which is essentially consuming uh, ATP to pump sodium outside the cell to provide the gradient for sodium movement. And the chloride channel is the green, um, the green staining here. And you can see that that's on another membrane. That's actually this apical membrane, which um, is continuous with the ductal system uh, where chloride is received. So over the last 25 years or so, we've collected an awful lot of information um, that um, James has used to model the, the dynamics of the calcium signal, both um, in time and space. And so we know that if we, if, we, if we isolate these cells and load them with a fluorescent dye, which is uh, responsive to calcium, that if we add the neurotransmitter, this is just an analog of acetylcholine, that we can get these beautiful uh, calcium oscillations in the cytoplasmic calcium concentration. And as you increase the concentration of the acetylcholine, you get a modest increase in the frequency of these oscillations before they, they give you this plateau type response. So there's temporal information in the signal. We can actually image um, the uh, gland. So this is basically a clump of asthma cells that we we've um, uh, isolated from a mouse um, and loaded with a fluorescent dye and again stimulated with acetylcholine. And what you can see is that it's not a monophasic rise in the calcium concentration. There's some spatial information in the signal. The signal is, is, is invariably global. Once it increases in a cell, it fills the whole cell. But the spatial information in that signals seem to uh, traverse gap junctions and move between cells. Um, and the, these data is, is, is in large part what we've used to model the calcium signaling dynamics uh, in these cells. We can also show again that these signals are, are, are global. Um, we're using an experimental maneuver where we produce a, a stimulus just at one side of the cell in a very small um, volume. And if we do that, you can see that we get a, a very small signal in the basolateral end of the cell. And then the signal initiates in the apical end of the, end of the cell and then globalizes. So this would be the blood face of the cell. And these, this is the apical edge of the cell here, this sort of Mercedes star. Um, it, is actually continuous with that ductal system. So the signal always starts in the apical region, but it's always global. Um, the signal is measured in isolated cells, it's kind of slow. Um, and th th these are the data that James has used to model um, the calcium signaling dynamics in, 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 in asthma cells over the last few years. <laughs> 
So I'm going to unshare. Go back over to James. Thank you, David. By the way, I couldn't see your pointer during your talk. You could not see my pointer. Okay. Uh, All right. I, I may have been the only person who couldn't see your pointer, but... No, I believe it's because he wasn't using full screen. He had maybe that kind of preview slide thing going. And I actually did have full screen, but I, I have two screens. One has the preview going, and I might have been pointing at the preview. I will work on that. Okay. <laughs> All right. So you've seen some of the data, and you've seen that the calcium has these beautiful patterns and that makes us think immediately as modelers <clears throat> that this is ripe for a mathematical model. So let's have a look at the basic physiological mechanisms that underlie uh, those oscillatory patterns. And this is a very brief summary. And if you haven't seen this stuff before, then you won't, re you won't remember it, of course, but that's not a huge deal. Calcium sits at the center, and I actually, can you all see my pointer when I wiggle my mouse on screen? Yes. Oh, good, okay. So calcium sits at the center of this bunch of interactions and feedback loops. Here's the agonist that comes along, binds to a receptor that starts off a series of reactions that ends in the formation of the stuff called IP3, which stands for inositol trisphosphate. And this IP3 diffuses through the cytoplasm of the cell and binds to IP3 receptors, which are positioned on the endoplasmic reticulum. The endoplasmic reticulum has a high calcium concentration, while the cytoplasm has a very low calcium concentration. There are other calcium channels, like the ryanodine receptors, that can also let out calcium. Calcium is buffered. Uh, very extensively, at least 99% of all the calcium that comes into the cell is immediately buffered by large proteins, probably more. Calcium can, can come in through channels from the outside. It's pumped out through plasma membrane pumps into the outside, and it's pumped back into the endoplasmic reticulum again by ATPase pumps. There are also mitochondrial fluxes, which do, do not appear in our model. There are lysosome fluxes. There are many other kinds of calcium fluxes, uh, many of which are quite a lot smaller. At any rate, in the, in the parotid and pancreatic cells, it's this IP3 receptor flux that is the most important thing by a considerable margin. Now, the basic mechanism of calcium oscillations goes like this. You have a very low calcium concentration in the cytoplasm of the cell. You have a very high calcium concentration in the endoplasmic reticulum. And you have a very high calcium concentration outside the cell. That means that the cytoplasm of the cell is under intense calcium pressure. About three or four orders of magnitude is the difference in those concentrations. Therefore, all you have to do is open up these calcium channels just a little bit. You don't open them up much, you open them up just a little bit, or you can increase this leak just a little bit, and calcium rushes in. And the cytoplasm of calcium concentration zooms up real fast. You then shut these channels very quickly, as fast as you can, and then these circuit pumps and these PM pumps, they then remove the calcium. So when the calcium rushes in, the calcium goes up, the influx channels close, the pumps start removing the calcium, so the calcium goes back down. And that cycle repeats, giving you regular cycles of calcium release, calcium reuptake, and that is what gives you an oscillation of the calcium concentration. That's the basic phenomenology. But how does one construct models? Well, we construct models now in a very modular kind of way. All these components that we were talking about here, the mitochondria, the IP3 receptor, the ryanodine receptor, et cetera, et cetera, they all have their own submodels. And therefore, to construct an overall model, you simply take all these submodels, which already exist, and stick them all together into the same box. So, for example, for a parotid cell, 
for a salivary as an R cell, we know that the circuit pumps are important. So we take that model and stick it in. We know the PM pumps, the plasma membrane pumps are important. We put that in. We know that the IP3 receptors, these IPR, these calcium channels, they're very important. And we know that store operated calcium channels are very important. So we put in those four components to our model. Again, using mostly pre-built models that to be honest, many of which David and I have constructed ourselves. Buffers we actually include also, but we do that in, a, in an implicit way rather than an explicit way. We don't look at mitochondria, so we don't put those in. L-type calcium channels are not important, we think, so we don't put those in. So we make this bunch of choices. And that gives us eventually a set of ODEs or a set of PDEs, which has a sort of generic form that looks a bit like this. So you can see a typical reaction diffusion equation. Here's your diffusion bit, and here are all your reactions. Here's a typical buffering term, your typical mitochondrial fluxes, plasma membrane fluxes, ER fluxes, et cetera, et cetera. And depending upon which parts or which components you decided to include, that will tell you whether you include JRYR, for example. In our model, we don't. Do you include JI in our model? No, we don't. Do we include these mitochondrial fluxes in our model? No, we don't. But this reaction diffusion equation for calcium is then coupled to a fairly extensive, fairly large collection of other equations which control the other stuff. So for example, an IPR model has a bunch of associated ODEs, not PDEs, they're ODEs, a bunch of associated ODEs that control the states of this IPR model. I'm sure most of you have seen this kind of thing in the Hodgkin-Huxley model, where you have associated ODEs for M, N, and H inside the Hodgkin-Huxley model. And then you have a PDE, a reaction diffusion equation for the voltage. The mathematical structure of these calcium equations. Oh yeah, of course. Is this, is this reaction diffusion occurring within a cell or is this across many cells? I'm coming to that, just a sec. What I've written here is within a cell, but you'll see, you'll see some computations across multiple cells. Okay? I take it that's, that's, that's okay. In, in, anyway, all right. And so this reaction diffusion equation is then coupled to a whole bunch of equations that control the membrane potential of both the apical membrane and the basal membrane. So we have two different membrane potentials and we model these by Kirchhoff's law, this usual CDV by DT, plus the current is equal to zero. These ionic currents are, are, are potassium, sodium, and chloride, and we model those in uh, fairly standard ways. The um, chloride currents are calcium dependent, the potassium currents are calcium dependent. And so as you can see, that gives us a relatively large, well, quite a few, ODEs, which we then couple into our calcium equation, and our calcium equation then controls these ionic currents, and we get an overall closed model. Now, there are other components too that we have to include, and I'm not going to tell you what the equations are, because you can all imagine the kinds of equations. It's much more important to see all the different components, and this is a somewhat daunting slide because it has a bunch of stuff in it, but the point of this is simply that you can't really model this kind of fluid transport without including all these bits and pieces. So we have a sodium potassium ATPase, we have an anion exchanger, which uh, exchanges chloride, bicarbonate and sodium. This turns out to be very important. We have a, a sodium hydrogen or sodium proton exchanger. We have an NKCC1 sodium chloride potassium. We have a whole bunch of these channels in both the apical region, uh, the apical region, there are some, and a bunch more in the basal region. And each one of these comes with a flux, comes with a current, comes with a model, comes sometimes with calcium dependence, sometimes not. And so we end up with ODEs for the sodium, the potassium, the chloride, and the calcium, and the two voltages, apical and basal. So that's six ODEs for the cell, plus another three ODEs for the lumen, for the concentrations in the lumen, which gives us a total of nine ODEs, which is not too bad really, but it's a, it can be sometimes a numerical headache. All right, so that gives you an idea of the model structure, and I'm sure 
just about all of you can picture in your minds the kinds of equations that would be used for that. But now let me give you an idea of the basic overall behavior. This is kind of, whoops, this is kind of what happens in the model. In the basal part of the cell, the agonist binds, IP3 is made. IP3 then diffuses through the cell, and there's a positive feedback system between the IP3 receptors and the calcium. Actually, there's a negative feedback system as well. One is fast, one is slow, and it's, it's, a, it's a complicated regulated channel, this one here. It's the, at the heart of our model. Anyway, in brief, there's a positive feedback system which uh, leads to the release of a large amount of calcium, but that calcium is released in the apical region of the cell, which is why you get the, the, uh, the large response, as you saw in the experimental data, you get the large response in the apical region because that's where the IP3 receptors sit. In fact, this is one of the uh, major results that David has shown over the last couple of years, is that the IP3 receptors, they practically all sit really close to the apical membrane. And that matters, actually, because that structural information, it determines what kind of mechanism could possibly explain these results. All right, so when you get a big calcium release here, you then get a back-propagated wave of calcium by a generic excitable mechanism, which could be through ryanidine receptors, it could be through other types of IP3 receptors, it doesn't really matter. But you get a back-propagated excitable wave, and the calcium then propagates back to the basal region of the cell, giving a global response. And you have to have calcium in the basal region because it has to activate the uh, potassium channels which sit in the basal region and you've got to activate those potassium channels otherwise the membrane depolarizes and you don't get any chloride flux and you don't get water transport. So that's the basic system, the basic sequence of events that leads to water transport in a single cell. But let's get back to what Bard said and things get quite a lot more complicated. As you saw we had a we had a structure of multiple cells, and then we had ducts going all over the place, little fingers, blah, blah, blah. And from the experimental data, or the experimental data is a series of optical slices, you get a series of optical slices, you can reconstruct those. I say you can reconstruct them. What I mean is you give it to John Rugas, who can then reconstruct them, because I don't do any. I'm way too important to do this kind of stuff. So John does it instead. And this is a simple reconstruction of the experimental data of the, of the lumen. You can see it has this fingered structure, fingers going all over the place. And here's the reconstruction of the cells. And if you put it into a, a finite element three-dimensional mesh, you get an idealized reconstruction of the lumen here. And you can see from this right-hand side that the lumen sits within these cells. And each cell is like a ball and the lumen sort of wraps around it in a finger-like thing. So the fingers, if you can see my hands here, the fingers are the lumen and my fist is the cell. And that comes directly from anatomical reconstructions. You then take the equations and you solve them on this three-dimensional mesh. And I say you solve them. What I mean is John Rugas solve, solves them, of course. John Rugas is the modeler who does all the real work in this. And then you get typical results which look like this. I'll let the movie play on the left. And here are apical and basal responses, two representative traces from a single cell. Here's the flow of fluid, the rate of uh, fluid coming out of the entire group of seven cells. There are seven cells here. And as you can see, each cell is not coordinated with each other cell. And so you get sort of beating like patterns in the, in the rate of fluid secretion. And you can see you get, uh, you can, you can uh, predict what the chloride concentrations and the bicarbonate and the potassium and the sodium, et cetera. You can say what all those are. Th those are not predictions, of course. Those are just facts that the model really has to reproduce because these numbers, with the exception of bicarbonate, in fact, are all pretty well known and the model does a pretty good job. And you can see in the model, the calcium spreads in waves. It starts in the apical region, and then it spreads across the cell in this active propagation to form a global response. Typical. You can go to other kinds of investigations. You can say, well, what about if the, uh, if the, if the lumen had a dif different structure, if the acinus had a different structure? This is all color-coded. Here's a, 
uh, the cells color coded by where they sit on the branch of the lumen here. And if you changed around this, uh, this topology, changed around where the branches were, put them in a different, in, in a different configuration, would this make any difference? The answer is, well, no, it doesn't make any difference. And basically, we've tried a whole pile of different things. We've tried having more complicated calcium models. We tried using simple ODEs. We tried rearranging things. And essentially, the answer is that the salivary gland, it secretes just like it's 10,000 identical independent cells. And that's what it does. And any coupling between cells basically makes almost no difference at all. Okay, now that's, well, not much anyway. That's where the models got to about a year ago. But there's a huge but, and this is where David comes back in. Yes, I can see your mouse now, David. But I can't hear yeah, you. You need to unmute yourself. Please unmute yourself. There we go. Can't rub my belly and chew gum at the same time. I've got a pointer working, but anyway. Okay, so um, as James said, so about a year ago, all the data that the model was built on had come from isolated, isolated ass and eye. So essentially, um, a, a, Library gland from a mouse digested to, to little clumps, and then we we can we can monitor those on the stage of a microscope. Well, you know, obviously, um, library glands are not little clumps of cells on the stage of a microscope. Um, they 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 the environment inside the mouse is obviously quite important. What we're not reproducing um, by isolating the cells is the contacts they have with other cells, the contacts they have with the extracellular matrix that surrounds the cells, and the contact that they have with the, um, with the basement membranes. The other thing that we're not really modeling very well experimentally is how the salivary gland sees the acetylcholine. We essentially blow it over the cells in a square wave pulse, and they see a constant concentration of acetylcholine, and then we wash it away. And that's clearly not what um, the cells will experience when the um, acetylcholine is being released from a, from a neuron. Um, they're gonna see um, probably a sawtooth of acetylcholine, which is, in, which is applied in a pulsatile manner. So we decided that we, we really needed to measure these calcium signals in the mouse. And so, so what we decided to do is to set up an experimental platform where we could do that. Um, and so the, what we do is we uh, express fluorescent proteins, genetically uh, modified animals, which express fluorescent proteins in the mouse salivary gland behind um, a, some genetic uh, jiggery pokery that allows us to put them in individual cells. So this is um, a mouse that expresses a red fluorescent protein in all of its membranes. And we're gonna take a Z stack. So these, the mouse has now had, had surgery, the salivary glands have been expo exposed, and we're now going to interrogate the fluorescence by multi-photon microscopy on the stage of a microscope. The mouse is anesthetized, still alive, etc. So this is just to show you the structure of the gland. Uh, we can get um, about 70 microns deep into the gland. What you're seeing now are the, the red membranes of the asinus cells. And as we get deeper into the glands, we're actually seeing the ducts, which don't stain quite as brightly. So um, we can now express a probe, specifically in the asthma cells, which responds to an increase in calcium. And it's called GCAMP6F. It's uh, based on green fluorescent protein the calcium binding motif and it um, changes its fluorescence when, cal when calcium is bound to it. So what we do now is we um, attach electrodes to a, to a bundle of um, blood vessels and nerves going into the salivary gland and we can, we can stimulate the salivary glands. So now these, uh, this is a field of view of salivary glands um, expressing GCAMP6F, the uh, the uh, signal is color-coded, and now we're recording um, 
um, 10 times a second, um, the fluorescence when we stimulate the um, nerve going into the cell with 10 Hertz um, stimulation. And here's some readout of some of these boxes, which are um, regions of interest placed on, on, the, um, on, on the screen. And again, this was software developed by John Rugas, which has really helped us uh, facilitate the analysis of this. So essentially what we see, at, the, at least at these high frequencies, and th this is a high frequency of stimulation, is something that's not so dissimilar to what we've seen in isolated cells. However, if we move um, to lower frequencies of stimulation, uh, which are uh, frequencies of stimulation where we actually see the mouse salivating and record these signals, um, what we see is actually the signals are, are actually localized. So what I'm showing you here are um, standard deviation images. So essentially showing where, where the biggest changes are for low frequency stimulation versus high frequency stimulation. Where you see these, these red fire plots is where the signal is highest over the whole movie. And you can see that we're not really getting global signals anymore. The signals are highly localized to the apical end of the cell where, where the IP3 receptors are. If we go to higher magnification and play the movie, you can see this. So focusing, focusing on this asinus here, when we stimulate, you can see that the signal is highly localized, very rapid. Again, this is 20 frames a second and, and does not globalize. So there are maintained gradients of calcium in the apical end of the cell. And sort of gratuitous use of movies here is a, a 3D plot again of this area here. And you can see that um, when the cell, when the, when the, uh, the slice is uh, stimulated that the signals um, are in the center of the cell which corresponds to the apical end of the cell and never globalize out to the to the whole cell. So again, if we take this that same image uh, movie set and take um, a standard deviation image, showing you where the largest changes are and just focus on this cell, this group of cells here, this asinus, probably a group of about seven or eight cells, then again, you can see that the highest signal as indicated by the yellow um, coloration is really right around the apex of the cell. And again, the topographical plot shows you that's where the highest signal, signal is. Um, manually, if you um, analyze the signals, you can essentially trace where the cells are in this, in this asinus, place a region of interest on, on the cell. So here's one in the apical end and here's one in the basal end. And you can see that there's absolutely uh, no signal in the basal end of the cell. And really what we're getting is standing oscillations occurring in, uh, in the apical end of the cell, which is completely different. We've never ever seen this in isolated cells. So we had to come up with a way of analyzing these apical signals, because as you can imagine in a field of view um, with, with 10 to 20 frames a second, it's very laborious to place regions of interest on, on, on these, these, these images in image J. So John Rugas came up with a way of analyzing these for us. And essentially we use an average or a standard deviation image um, to create a mask. And the mask um, isolates the apical ends of cells. We take the mask and read out the individual uh, pixel intensities in, in each of these regions of interest. So that's the variation. Each one of these, um, this noise is essentially the changes in pixel intensity over the, the, the time course. And then plots an average, um, you can see in the black here. We can then take these, um, these image sets and compare the responses at different frequencies. Again, this is um, in script that, that John has written for us. And you can see that this region of interest essentially did not respond at one hertz, started to respond at two hertz. 
giving nice oscillations at five hertz and plateaus at 10 hertz. So out of those 35 regions of interest, um, the script that John wrote will allow us to average those 35 uh, regions of interest and give us the average response in all the regions of interest in the cell. And this would have taken not me, but a postdoc, probably the best part of a week to analyze um, this, this particular experiment. And John's script does it in about 17 seconds. So that's, that's, re that's really, really helped an awful lot. So from a, a preliminary analysis of, of these data from um, multiple mice, we can see, we can calculate the frequency of these oscillations. Um, the one thing to, to, to show here is that they're actually much quicker than we saw in uh, isolated asthma cells. So instead of three or four a minute, we're now seeing um, roughly, roughly uh, one every two, two seconds or so, or one a second. And the frequency doesn't really change an awful lot. It doesn't really change an awful lot. So what we think is happening is as we, we're not, we're not pacing the cell, so we're not getting a response every time the, um, the stimulator stimulates the cell. What we think is happening at low frequency is that the, the acetylcholine or a neurotransmitter is released and it decays. Um, and uh, if, the frequ if the frequency of stimulation is high enough, it never decays back to baseline. And we get to a point where we reach a threshold for a calcium signal. Um, and that that would be the latency of the response. And then the inherent oscill oscillatory uh, activity of the cell kicks in. As we increase the frequency, again, we're um, not allowing the, um, the acetylcholine to get back to baseline. And, and, and essentially we reach that threshold much quicker, the latency shortens. And again, um, we, we start to, um, to stimulate uh, the, the oscillatory um, motif. So this has been somewhat difficult for us to rationalize with our model. I mean, our model essentially had calcium um, originating in the apical region of the cell and stimulating the chloride channel and then globalizing to activate the potassium channel, which kept the membrane potential polarized for chloride secretion. Um, so how do we rationalize that? Well, we rationalize that essentially based on a prediction that a model that um, a prediction from a model that that James wrote a, a few years ago um, and that was that that, that, that that salivary secretion actually worked better if there were potassium channels in the apical membrane and so um, he um, did some model runs putting various amounts of potassium channel in the apical membrane and showed that salivary secretion could potentially um, be better if that was the case. So we tested that, and we tested that by using um, a technique called uh, uncaging, which is essentially where we use a laser to focally increase calcium in one area of the cell. And we did this in either the apical end or the basal end of the cell. If we uncage just in the apical end, such that there was no calcium signal in the basal end of the cell, we could see a potassium conductance. So that actually um, verified or uh, verified what the model actually predicted. So we now, James now has um, to modify the model to accommodate the data from um, whole animals, which we believe is obviously the native situation. So I'll let you go, James. Right. Well, let me do a brief recap and a brief summary of where we basically sit right now. In the previous modeling work, there were a couple of critical aspects. And one critical aspect was that the calcium responses were global. You had to have a calcium response start in the apical region, which is where the IP3 receptors sit. But that calcium response had to be propagated across the entire cell as an excitable propagated wave in order to activate the calcium channels, uh, the uh, potassium channels in the basal membrane. This was a critical feature of the model. And in fact, the models struggled with mechanisms to propagate a calcium wave across a cell. The other 
well, that, uh, well, one other critical feature of the model was that there were separated, there were different channels on the basal membrane than there were on the apical membrane. The cell was very polarized, had different sets of bits and pieces on those two membranes. And this again was critical for the model function. Now that's all very well, but there were, there were questions already some years ago, we had got some data which didn't really fit in particularly well with this overall paradigm, particularly in some work with a guy called Janos Almasi, who is now in, David help me out, Prague? Correct, and in Hungary. In hung Hungary, yeah, okay. Uh, we'd worked with him and done a bunch of uh, joint work and the joint work was predicting that there actually were potassium channels in the apical membrane, which is where they shouldn't be. The model was also predicting that, well, maybe there were ATPases, sodium potassium ATPases in the apical membrane also, again, according to dogma, where they shouldn't be. Now we could incorporate these, these weird data, not weird data, but these unexplained data into our model, but we had to, we had to, you know, turn and we had the we had to be flexible okay so we were flexible and we incorporated it in and it didn't really disrupt the overall dogma but these new data which David has just collected it completely demolishes the overall dogma and that is because a the calcium oscillations are much much faster than we expected they're much faster than seen in isolated cells. And B, they are not global calcium responses. So what do we do? Well, it turns out, well, we believe that if we construct a new model, which has in effect the entire saliva secretion mechanism, all situated in the apical region, then we will be able to provide an explanation, not just for these new intravital data from live mice, but also an explanation for our previous data from some years ago that had been puzzling us. And it now seems that a single sort of unified mechanism can take everything into account in a consistent way, which is quite a nice thought, in fact. And the model would then go as follows. You have an apical region, of the cell, which is next to the lumen. And this apical region is essentially a self-generating saliva secretor. It has ATPases in it. It has calcium activated potassium channels. It has calcium activated chloride channels. It has all the IP3 receptors. And therefore you can get a calcium oscillation restricted to this apical region here, which does not propagate through the rest of the cell, but is still sufficient to activate fluid secretion. The sodium and the potassium and the chloride ions, they have such a high diffusion coefficient that they can diffuse through the rest of the cell very easily. Calcium, of course, has a much, much lower diffusion coefficient because of calcium buffering and calcium cannot diffuse in the same way. So this is now our proposal. We don't have a quantitative model for it yet. We haven't done it. We don't know whether it's going to work, but we are hoping that we will be able to construct, as I said, this unified model, which can make a consistent story of all the previous data, as well as the new data. And all we have to do for that is to throw away the current idea of how saliva secretion works and build a new paradigm. That is our goal in the coming few months, I suppose. That brings our talk to an end. It's good to mention that the current lab is and our collaborators, there's a whole bunch, I'm not gonna read out names, uh, but we of course rely on, rely on people, PhD students and postdocs and collaborators to do an awful lot of work for us. Let me mention again, John Rugas, who is here with us today. Uh, a large fraction of all the computations you've seen today and the movies and the videos were done by John, who I have to say does a brilliant job. And on that note, I will stop for questions. Thank you very much, um, uh, David and um, James for a very insightful talk. Um, um, I will open uh, the floor for questions if anybody has any.
I'll keep mine until the end. So James, stick around, we have a couple, but I'll uh, allow other people to ask questions. Uh, I got a question. So the frequency of the oscillations in vivo was a much faster than in the isolated cell prep. Is that the idea? Yep. And, the, and that reason was because it took time for the calcium to diffuse across the cell. Is that the reason? No, that's not the reason that the oscillations are faster. Okay. Why are the os oscillations faster in a live cell as opposed to an isolated cell? We don't know. Oh. I mean, we don't know what exactly has changed. The model can predict which parameters are different, but we haven't tested these, so we can't say for sure. Uh -huh. Uh, there are a couple of questions in the chat room. Um, so, I, I mean, it would have been great if you could read it. You said, like, ask a question yep. directly. I'm going to yep. wait maybe a couple of seconds if to, you know, to take over. If you don't want to, I could ask a question myself. Okay, I'll, I'll do it. So, um, how do you calibrate the connections when coupling these different pre built models? This is okay, the question, this is a question from Sami. That's actually, that's a very good question indeed. And a really good question. Calibrating those connections and deciding exactly how to connect up those different modules is a critical feature of how you build the model. And this depends on what question you're asking. When you go to build a model, you always have to have a question first because the question you're asking determines the kind of model you build. For example, if you're interested in stochastic aspects of calcium spiking, then you would couple up all those modules in a stochastic manner. You would have all kinds of stochastic models and they would be have some sort of uh, diffusion in a, in a small region and in some sort of microdomain. And that would give you a very different kind of connection between those modules than you would get in, say, some homogeneous, whole cell, well-mixed ODE kind of model. So there is no one answer, but the answer is you have to do it really carefully, depending upon exactly what question you're asking. So I, if that's not sufficient, you can maybe type in chat and say, no, James, that was a rubbish, bloody answer. Give me a decent one or something. <laughs> There's one more. Um, how does the structure of the compartments of the cell included in the model? I think- Okay, so there are, I, right, that's another really good question. And in fact, what we do is we assume that the cell is a homogenized region. Even if it's spatially distributed, we assume that the ER, the endoplasmic reticulum, is essentially an inf uh, infinitely you know, small periodic space which you can homogenize. And therefore, each part of the cell, uh, of inside the cell, is both a part of the cytoplasm and a part of the, of the ER. And the fluxes are then compensate. Uh, then you you um, uh, scour the fluxes to compensate for the different volumes of the ER and of the of the cytoplasm. That's basically straight out of homogenization theory. The other uh, compartments, such as the mitochondria or the lysosomes, they don't appear in the model at all. Dr. Kadro, can I ask a question? Go ahead. Go ahead. Hi, Dr. Snaid. <laughs> Hi, last. Um, I'm a PhD student in uh, University of Waterloo, Canada, and uh, I'm actually working on uh, unusual behavior of calcium in GnRH cells. Oh, yeah. Okay. We, we wrote a fantastic model in 2015, which shows sort of wave behavior of calcium along the dendron. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But by the experimental data, actually, it's supposed to be not the wave, but the whole sort of tsunami uh, going bigger and bigger towards the end. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And so we are trying with Dr. Campbell, my supervisor, figure out the mechanism of what is happening. And uh, yeah, recently in front of endocrinology, we, wrote, we read even that there is sort of similar supposition that it's supposed to be this excitation around the whole wave of the calcium to produce sort of surge. Right, right, right. Do you think, because this, this is really unusual behavior, do you think that maybe uh, some, um, another 
messengers sort of maybe it's excitation in mitochondria which sort of produce this additional tsunami or something it should be something additional yeah, that we are looking sort of we don't yeah. see right now okay so a that's a very good question b i don't know the answer <laughs> that's c, <laughs> send me your stuff. Send me what you've been working on, and we can talk about that offline because I'm very interested in calcium in GnRH neurons, and there are other people in New Zealand who are also interested. So we should definitely set up some sort of correspondence, and I'll have a look at the data and think about it more. But immediately, off the top of my head, I have no idea. Fantastic. It means I have something to write for my PhD. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, so uh, there's one more question um, that I would uh, read here. It's actually my also my question. Uh, could it be that cells in vivo have more connections those than in vitro? For example, like through IP3 receptor, uh, IP3 diffusion, because you have these connections or gap junctions that could connect these cells together that could induce these kind of fast oscillations in calcium. I think. I mean, I think the the number of connections in vivo is undoubtedly going to be different from uh, from the in vitro situation. And those connections are going to be different as well. I mean, there's going to be lots of interactions with extracellular matrix and more interactions with the cells surrounding. Um, we, James has done some modeling of, um, and he can talk about that, but of calcium and IP3 going through gap junctions and what that would do for secretion um, that was something that we, that was a portion of the grant that we have just, were just awarded last year. Um, and I don't know whether you've actually done that modeling or not, James. Well, I've, yeah, in the past, we've done quite a lot of modeling yeah. on particularly IP3 going through gap junctions because calcium going through gap junctions seems, in all my experience, to have almost no effect at all because it's buffered so heavily. IP3 does go through gap junctions quite well. It does stimulate responses in the neighboring cells. If you have two coupled cells, which are coupled by the intercellular diffusion of IP3, that changes the calcium oscillations in each of the individual cells, but it does not have any significant effect on the total amount of saliva secreted. So even though you can have different oscillatory patterns in your group of seven cells, if the connections are different, you do not have a change in saliva secretion. In other words, saliva secretion does not depend on the frequency of the calcium oscillation. It's not a frequency encoded message. It does not depend upon having an oscillation. Calcium can go up and stay flat and you get the exact same amount of saliva. The only thing these cells care about when they're making saliva is the average calcium. End of story. Now, does that mean that if you have more connections in vivo than those in vitro, you will change the calcium dynamics? Yes. Will they make it faster? It's possible that will. We don't know. Will it affect saliva secretion? I guarantee you it won't. I mean, the other thing that could be happening in vivo is that it's not just interactions between cells and, and, and the cells in their um, extracellular environment. It's just that when you've disrupted the cell's um, native localization, then you start to disrupt where tight junctions are. And then essentially your structure, your polarization is starting to get lost. And then, you know, your, the relationship between the endoplasmic reticulum and mitochondria, the endoplasmic reticulum and the plasma membrane, these things can change. And I think that's going to influence the calcium signal. Um, any other question? Okay, can I ask one more question? So, so this is mine as well. So uh, one of the uh, simulations that you showed us, uh, you know, with these calcium oscillations, um, um, one thing that, um, that I've noticed is that the first peak is always bigger than the rest of these oscillations, this transient peak that you have. And um, we are encountering similar problem with other cell lines when we do these simulations to look at calcium oscillations. And this is a feature uh, that is associated with the Lierens model. Uh, so have you ever been able to resolve it because we never managed ever to resolve that issue? 
Okay, so yeah, that initial peep when you first put on the agonist, that's not just the Lee Rinsel model. That's as far as I know, practically every single calcium model in the universe does I know, that. I know. Yeah, it does that because the total calcium in the cell is different when you first put on the agonist than when you don't. So if you do a bifurcation analysis of the cell of the model equations using the total calcium as a slow parameter in the fantastic way that John Rinzel, I, you may not remember John, but you gave a talk at NYU 300 years ago when I was a graduate student about using calcium as a slow parameter for a bursting oscillator. And I was truly inspired by that talk, truly inspired. Anyway, in the style of John Rinzel, you let calcium be a slow bifurcation parameter and look at the bifurcation structure of these calcium models and you can see why the first peak is fast because you have a lot of calcium in the cell. It releases a whole lot initially, but then gradually the total calcium comes down and it stabilizes to an oscillation. Now that's not what happens all the time in real cells for a number of reasons. You, the agonist goes on much more slowly. There's a, there's a much more gradual ramp um, and the cells themselves could be different. Um, but I, I believe that I understand this very well in in the theory, um, and I, as far as we know, I mean, David and I, if, if you take that theory, you can make a whole bunch of predictions. David and I and Trevor Shuttleworth tested those predictions in hex cells, and they all work out. So as far as we know, that is, in fact, the reason, certainly for hex cells, and probably for salivary cells, and probably for your cell line also. I make that claim. Now you go away and prove me wrong. <laughs> okay. But I, I can send you a whole bunch of papers with the bifurcation analysis. And it's, uh, um, it's, it's fairly standard, yeah. Okay. Um, all right, so any other question? Um, last call. Okay, so uh, let's uh, thank our speakers for today, uh, James and David. Uh, that was very uh, exciting talk and uh, we learned a lot, I'm, I'm guessing from you. Yeah speaking for everyone here, but um, yeah. So thank you very much for the talk. Thank you very much for inviting us. It was a real pleasure. It was a pleasure to see so many old friends again and to see a bunch of new faces as well. Thank you very much for sitting and listening to us. Thank you. Bye. Great seeing you both.